I came across some apology notes this week, <clears throat> handwritten apology notes. One says, sorry I bought too much Spongebob episodes. Sincerely, Hannah. I feel bad, I want you to have this. And there's a nickel taped to the piece of paper. Another one is a big sign in a neighborhood that says, Dear Ohio Avenue Neighbors, I put a cute love note on what I thought was my wife's car last night. We figured out today that in my tired state, I put this note on the wrong car. If this happened to be yours, I apologize for the confusion. I am not in love with you. <laughs> Sorry. One more, this is my favorite, handwritten note. I hit your car, I'm sorry. There's only a scratch on the back left panel, but because you look rich, I'm not leaving my number. <laughs> sorry. Some funny stories of handwritten apologies. But in our Christian life, have we ever had to apologize to God? Have you ever, ever had to tell him sorry? Maybe you told them something was wrong or wasn't going well, but later you had to ask for grace and mercy. Have you ever doubted God that he was true or active and working in our world? Have you ever wondered if what he says in his Bible will come true? If the predictions of him coming back to earth will ever happen? Have you ever doubted about what scripture teaches is working right now, that he hears our prayers, that he loves us, that he cares for us or guides us. We're starting a new series of messages today as part of our Advent season, looking at the characters of Christmas. We're gonna look at Zacharias, Elizabeth, Joseph and Mary. And today we're gonna to start with Zacharias, a man that was faithful to serve God had some doubts of God, but eventually praises God when everything occurs. So let's look at our God's word and prepare ourselves for the Christmas time that's arriving. And the first thing we're going to see, let's look at the Gospel of Luke. We're going to be in Luke for all but the messages except for Joseph. In Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, Luke describes the family of Zacharias, saying in Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. In these three verses, as we learn about Zacharias's family, the author Luke speaks about them. He describes their lineage. They're both from priestly families, both from the right families if you're going to be serving in the temple. My translation calls Zacharias a Zacharias. Zachariah was a common name in the Old Testament. There's 29 different names a guy's named Zechariah in the Old Testament. But as we come to the New Testament, the Greek form of Zechariah is Zacharias. So mine is, says Zacharias. If you have an NIV or NLT, it might say Zechariah. Same guy, same name, just a slightly different way to translate that Old Testament Hebrew name for us. So we learn about this lineage of Zacharias and Elizabeth's. And Luke tells us about their lifestyle as well in verses 6 and 7. He gives this declaration. They were righteous in the sight of God. That describes their moral righteousness, how they conformed to God's standards and followed God's law. And then Luke gives this description of them. They were walking blamelessly in all the commandments and in the requirements of the Lord. But in spite of their blamelessness, Elizabeth 
was barren. That's the tragic situation of this childless couple. Luke makes it clear these two were from the right family. They were doing the right deeds. You'd expect they got the right results, that God would bless them with the kid, but they didn't have any children. Tony Evans writes about these verses here. He says, this detail reminds us we must never assume that trials and difficulties only come our way because of our disobedience. God often brings or allows suffering into the lives of his people for his glorious purposes and for our sanctification. See, what the author is doing here, Luke is doing, is he's showing that these people were doing the right things, they were obedient to God, but God ultimately has a plan. They were older in years, they didn't expect to have kids, but God is going to do something miraculous in their lives. And just as the author Luke has spoken there in those first three verses, next, the angel Gabriel speaks. And as he's speaking, we learn about the faithfulness of Zacharias, how he was a dedicated priest. Starting in verse 8, it says, Now it happened that while Zacharias was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, according to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. These verses remind us that Zacharias was a dedicated priest. See, when this was happening in about 4 BC, there were approximately 18,000 priests in the area of Judea. And how it would work is they divided them into 24 different groups, and each group of priests would take a one-week kind of uh, position at the temple twice a year to do their work. And as part of that, that work that they would do there, they would cast lots, which was kind of like a die that they would toss to decide who got to go inside the temple and burn the incense, which they did in the morning and in the afternoon. And out of the 18,000 priests that were alive at that time, Zacharias gets selected to go in and burn the incense offering. This was something you only got to do one time in your entire lifetime as a priest, if you were selected. This was Zacharias' kind of crowning moment as a priest in Judea. Imagine working your whole career maybe as a social worker and the National Association of Social Workers call you and they say, we want you to come as you're retiring at the end of your career and tell us your story and inspire and encourage all the young social workers at our conference. Maybe you graduated from high school or college and they call you and they invite you to come back and speak at the commencement service and talk about your life. This is something similar to Zechariah. This was his kind of crowning moment, his legacy moment as a priest. So he's there in the temple. He's offering this prayer of incense. And as he's inside burning the incense and praying for the people of Israel and Judea, there's a group of people also outside probably praying for him and for their nation as well. And that's when the angel Gabriel shows up. In verse 11, he burns the incense. Maybe as the smoke starts to clear, he notices someone's in the room with him. Verse 11, it says, And an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel, and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid. Zacharias, for your petition has been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son. And you will give him the name John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and will drink no wine or liquor. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, while yet in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children 
and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now when this angel shows up, we don't know his name yet, but when this angel shows up, it's good to remember God has not spoken to the nation of Israel for more than 400 years. The last words recorded in the Old Testament are in, are in Malachi, about 435 BC, and they've gone through 400 years of silence. Wars and struggles and being a ping pong ball between different nations that want their land and being conquered, having their temple defiled. God has not spoken for those 400 years. But this angel shows up. And Zechariah rightly was troubled, at least my translation says. He was troubled when he sees this angel in verse 12. The NIV says he was gripped with fear. The message says he was paralyzed with fear. Zacharias didn't expect it. This was not a common occurrence to see an angel. And the angel tells him that his prayer has been answered. Probably part of that prayer was for the nation of Israel, for guidance for them and for a future Messiah and provision. But he also references a prayer for a son. He tells Zacharias, you are going to have a son. Your petition has been answered. This angel shares a prophecy fulfilling the last words in the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 and Malachi chapter 4 verses 5 through 6 describe this future forerunner, this future Elijah-like prophet, this future guy that will prepare the nation for the Messiah. Those were the last words spoken in the Old Testament. And this angel, angel shows up to Zacharias and says, it's time for that prophecy to come true. It's time for that prophet to be born. And by the way, it's going to happen through your barren wife. The point I think we should make sure we notice here is that Zacharias, he had been faithfully serving God even when Zacharias probably didn't think his prayers were going to be answered. Priests at that time started their service when they were about 20 years old and usually retired at about the age 50. Sounds like a good, good time to retire, right, at 50? They still had to do work, but it wasn't in the temple. But they would do about a 30-year service in the temple. So Zacharias was probably approaching 50 years old. He's got gray hair, wrinkles. His bones and joints probably ached. The time for having children had been passed. I'm sure he prayed many, many times for children. But when that prayer didn't come true, he stuck with God. He kept serving God. He kept doing his ministry. Zacharias stuck with God. He didn't say things like, you didn't answer my prayers, God. See you later. He didn't say, God, if you were real, you would show yourself to me. Instead, he probably said things like, God, I love you, and I know you, I, you have a plan. I trust you. Maybe he said, God, you're good, and you know what you're doing. Zacharias continued in ministry as a priest, even when God didn't answer his prayers for a kid. Warren Rearsby writes, he says, You have probably noticed that God often speaks to his people and calls them while they're busy doing their daily tasks. Both Moses and David were caring for sheep when God called them. Gideon was threshing wheat. Peter and his partners were mending nets when Jesus called them. It, was difficult. it is difficult to steer a car when the engine is not running. When we get busy, God starts to direct us. And that was Zacharias, still going to the temple, still doing his work, even when he probably didn't think God would answer his prayers. And that's a great reminder for us that we faithfully serve God even when he appears distant from us. We must remember that we report to God. God doesn't report to us. He is Lord and in charge. We are not Lord and in charge of him. We pray to him and we ask things of him. And he does 
answer our prayers. I think God enjoys answering our prayers. When we love Him and we faithfully serve Him, I think He enjoys answering our prayers. But there are times when our prayers maybe don't match God's plan. And when our prayers don't match God's plan, His plan ultimately prevails. So Zacharias, he's continued to serve God faithfully for all those years. It's a good example of faithfulness to God. And right as we're about to give him an award and hold him up as our hero because of his faithfulness, we see Zacharias' failure. Verse 18 says, Zacharias said to the angel, How will I know this for certain? For I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. Here we meet Zacharias, the doubting priest. And if we can enter Zacharias' mind here, let's remember this is his crowning achievement. This is his best day at work he's probably ever had. His time of having children is past. He might have made peace with that, just realized it's not going to happen. He's come to grips with it. He's gotten over it. This is his best day of his life working. And this angel shows up and tries to tell him he's going to have a child. I wonder if he thought, why you got to bring that up? I was having a good day. I've made peace with that. Or typical guy response, I don't want to talk about that. He doesn't believe it's possible, so he asks for a sign, almost letting us kind of feel like he wants to believe it. He just wants a sign to let, us, let him know it's going to happen. So that doubting priest becomes the deaf priest. Verse 19, we meet this angel, angel named Gabriel. The angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you shall be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place, because you do not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. The people were waiting for Zacharias and were wondering at his delay in the temple. But when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. When the days of his priestly service were ended, he went back home. After these days, Elizabeth, his wife, became pregnant, and she kept herself in seclusion for five months. Now, when this guy named Gabriel shows up, and Gabriel shares his name to Zacharias, Zacharias probably straightened up a little bit. Because if he was familiar with the book of Daniel, he knew about this angel named Gabriel. There's only two angels named in our Bible, Gabriel and Michael. And not just that, there are some extra writings that we, we call the pseudepigrapha, which are a bunch of different writings that were circulating at the time of Zacharias that were sometimes prayer books or hymn books or apocalyptic end time literature, sometimes just commentaries on things going on. And in the pseudepigrapha, there are two sections that talk about a group of angels that are always around the throne of God. And Gabriel is listed in those writings as one of those seven angels that are always around the throne. Raphael, Uriel, Gabriel, Michael, Penuel, and Suriel, and Regel, right? So he knew this guy, Gabriel, was a real angel when he showed up. So Gabriel gives Zechariah a sign, but it's a sign that he will be deaf and mute. In Luke chapter 1, verse 62, when the people go to ask, Zacharias, a question, they give him signs to ask him a question. They don't talk to him. So not only was Zacharias not able to speak, some people think he might not have even been able to hear. He might have also been deaf through this sign. Gabriel pretty much says, Zacharias, this is going to happen, and if you don't believe it, I'm going to keep you silent so you can't talk about it with anybody until it actually occurs. 
See, Zacharias doubted God's plan because he couldn't see a path for it to occur. He references that his wife is old and later in years. See, God had decided it was time to send John the Baptist, to send that forerunner, that person to get things ready for Jesus. But when Zacharias didn't believe God's message, God decided to mute Zacharias so he couldn't talk about it. God has a prophecy to fulfill, and he wasn't going to let Zacharias prevent anything from happening or talk negatively about it. It's like God takes Zacharias out of the game and puts him on the sideline while he continues to orchestrate the game. Allison Trites says, God's purposes were destined to triumph despite the faltering faith of an old man. And we too shouldn't be surprised, if, surprised sometimes if God removes us from a situation so he can accomplish his well, He has a plan for things he's going to do, and he's not going to let us get in the way of what he wants to do. There was a woman named Catherine Barnhill that worked in the country of Nigeria in the 70s doing Bible translation. At that time, Nigeria was the ninth largest country in the world, and there were 700 different languages spoken in Nigeria. And she was part of a large group of people sent there, usually people that were uh, white Westerners with graduate degrees that were sent to Nigeria to translate the Bible into the native languages. But through some things that happened and some rumors that got started, almost all the missionaries sent there to translate their language got pulled out. There were some rumors about the CIA using missionaries to up you know, uphold certain military groups and things like that. So all the Christian missionaries got pulled out except for this one lady who was left there. So she's faced, how do I get God's word translated into all these languages by myself? And at that time, usually Bible translation was done by people with graduate degrees and working with local people. But Catherine came up with a new way of teaching natives to translate it on their own. She developed a little guide and then published a book and then they started to use it. And then other countries started to use it. And she's known throughout the world for this little translation book that she created that helps natives translate God's word into their own languages. It's as if God says, I want my word to get translated and reach more people. So I'm going to take all those Christian missionaries out that had an established way of doing things and leave this one person there to accomplish my will. See, God might take us out of our home we love because he wants us to be somewhere new. He might remove some of the material things we love in our life because he wants us to focus on our relationship with others instead. So we've seen the family of Zacharias, his faithfulness, as well as his failure. And then we get to see the fulfillment of that prophecy. If we skip a few paragraphs to chapter 1, verse 57, we read about the wife Elizabeth and how she speaks. Zacharias has spoken, Gabriel has spoken, and Luke has talked to us. Now we hear from Elizabeth. And the child arrives in verses 57 and 58. Now the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth, and she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord had displayed his great mercy toward her, and they were rejoicing with her. So the child arrives and the crowd gathers. And they named the child. Verse 59. And it happened that on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. And they were going to call him Zacharias after his father. But his mother answered and said, No, indeed, he shall be called John. See, this was a common ritual act in Jewish families that they would give the child a name on the day of circumcision, about eight days after he was born. Usually there'd be at least ten witnesses to kind of give a testimony of this event. And usually, kind of typical of some of our culture, 
A boy would be named often after his father or his grandfather. And that's what the, the crowd seems to expect. They thought he'd be named Zacharias, just like his dad. But Elizabeth speaks up and she says, No, he shall be called John. Elizabeth is being obedient to Gabriel, probably through the testimony of Zacharias telling her about what happened and who this baby should be named. So the crowd protests the name of the child in verse 61. They said to her, There is no one among your relatives who's called by that name. They're almost maybe wondering, is she acting without Zechariah's consent? Is this an idea she has without him? So they made signs to his father as to what he wanted him called. And he asked for a tablet and he wrote as follows. His name is John. And they were all astonished. <laughs> See, they seem to make signs to Zacharias to ask him a question. That word used to describe how he was deaf sometimes was used of statues and idols that couldn't speak, nor could they hear. So he, Zacharias couldn't speak, but he possibly could not hear either. So they make signs to him. And Zacharias is convinced that the child should be named John. Notice the difference in the change of tense from Elizabeth in verse 60 to Zacharias in verse 63. Elizabeth said, the baby shall be called John. Zacharias says, his name is John. There's no doubt in Zacharias' mind. His reply indicates obedience and submission to God's message. Then Zacharias speaks again in verse 64, 65. And at once his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed, and he began to speak in praise of God. First words out of his mouth are in praise of the Lord. Fear came on all of those living around them, and all these matters were being talked about in all the hill country of Judea. All who heard them kept them in mind, saying, that when will this child, uh, sorry, what then will this child turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord was certainly with him. News spreads that something special is happening in Judea, in the nation of Israel. And the author Luke adds his own little note there at the end of 66. And the hand of the Lord was certainly with him. Something special was happening. And as we return our focus back to Zacharias, see, Zacharias, he learned to trust God's promises, not immediately, but eventually, as he saw God's plan unfold. He didn't believe the message at first, but he did believe the message when the baby showed up. Zacharias learned not to ask why or how, but instead to obey God's word. And that's a common theme of scripture if we think about it. God shows up to Moses and tells him, go speak to Pharaoh. Moses says, I can't speak, I stumble over my words. God shows up to Gideon and says, you're supposed to go and be this great warrior. He says, I am from the least group and I am the youngest. I can't lead anybody. Esther is told she needs to go intercede for the nation of the Jews and prevent their killing. She says, what if the king rejects me? I'll die if I show up. But she obeys. Responding to God means we don't ask why or how, but we do obey and trust him and his plans. The Bible consists not of amazingly talented people, but instead of people that obeyed and trusted God as he did great things through them. And we too sometimes need reminders that we should believe God will deliver his promises even when we don't see how. We need regular reminders that God fulfills his promises even if we don't see how. 
He is creative and he finds ways to make things happen even when we don't understand. He might tell us we need to go back to school to get more education, but we wonder how will I ever pay for school again? We might have a loved one that we've lost and we often wonder how are we ever going to get through all this grief that hurts so bad. Or a church that's going through a split or difficult times or can't find a pastor and they wonder, are we going to survive this time? God provides and he brings it all together. So as we wrap up this first character of Christmas we're looking at, a few questions as we reflect, reflect on Zacharias, a man that was changed by God's mercy. Do we faithfully serve God even when he seems distant? Do we follow God only because we think he provides for our needs? If God failed to follow through, would we still love him and follow him? Second group of questions. Have we experienced situations where God removed us so he could accomplish as well? Were there scenarios where he made us get out of the way so he could accomplish his plan? And last set of questions. Do we believe God will fulfill his plans even if we don't see a path for them to occur? Do we trust his creativity even if we don't know how it might be accomplished. Let's pray. God, thank you for a time of year where we get to celebrate how you sent your son in flesh and blood that became a human so that our sins could be forgiven. And thank you for your word and how you fill it with regular everyday people like Zacharias and Elizabeth, Joseph and Mary. People we can relate to, people that are like us, people that have struggles like us. I pray for our church family that you would encourage us and be with us and help us to have a strong faith. Help us to faithfully serve even when we don't understand what's going on. Help us to get out of the way when you have a plan if we're not following that plan. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you're able, I'll invite you to stand for an Advent benediction. These benedictions were written by a woman named Savannah de Benedetto. A hopeful benediction. Be people of hope. Let hope live in your heart and share the hope of Christ with all you meet. Share hope by noticing someone else's humanity. Share hope by listening to someone's story. Share hope by praying for our world. In this Advent season, we need to see feel, and share hope. As you go out into the wonder of God's creations, share hope with those you meet. Amen.